the Valley Jet DC-9 plummeted into the alligator-infested swamps of the Florida Everglades shortly after takeoff from Miami International Airport. Very deep. We see people waiting out there, and it is very hard to believe that there is an airplane uh, under all of this right Where now. Where is the wreckage of this aircraft? I mean, it seems to be only just little pieces, bits and pieces. Sources say the plane slammed nose first into the swamp at more than 300 miles per hour. An eyewitness saw the jetliner nosedive at a 75-degree angle. And he was doing, you know, a turn like that. I didn't know what was going on. And then after it turned up sideways, and that's when it started heading down. I mean, it went pretty much pretty much straight down. That's what I said. It's going to crash. It's going to crash. And then, boom, thing just blew up. At an airport in Washington, the NTSB's elite GO team assemble. They've been called from their homes. They've no idea how long they'll be gone. From the time we got the call to the time we launched the airplane with a full team going down to Miami, it was three and a half hours, which was a very quick launch for us. This is the first time that outside cameras have been allowed to fly in with the GO team. Well, it sounds like you got everything covered, Andy. In charge is Greg Fife, young, ambitious, and on his third major investigation. They're going to need at least one car. I need one. NTSB investigators are always shadowed by a board member, a political appointee. In this case, it's their deputy chairman, Robert Francis. It's your choice, the chairman. He wants to know what we're going to do as an investigative team, how we're going to do it, because he will be responsible while he's on scene for addressing the press. The neat thing is we can call on the uh, phone line, download the uh, drawings and the systems drawings for uh, various models of airplanes print out a paper copy on eight and a half by 11, take it off into the swamp or wherever with us, and um, then have a paper copy that you can look for this actuator or that spring and mark down serial numbers as you're walking around. So far, all they know is that a DC-9 has come down in the Florida Everglades with 110 people on board. There's a lot of adrenaline that's constantly pumping, and everyone was geared up. We know what we have to do. We know that there's going to be a lot of assistance provided to us, but how are we going to pull this off? How are we actually going to get out there, get the wreckage, do what we have to do, and figure out what happened? And there's this silence that came over everybody because I think the thought went through the entire cabin of that airplane because we all looked out the window and we were all probably thinking the same thing. How are we going to do this? Showtime. Over to this side, more to your left. Get close to your body. Yeah, to it really is showtime. Being America, every NTSB investigation is carried out under the full glare of the media. It was probably the most TV equipment I've seen in a very long time at any of them, probably comparable to the Super Bowl. I mean, there was cameras and trucks and everything else. As far as the eye can see, the Everglades is a featureless swamp. The DC-9 has disappeared in three feet of water. We got over the accident site, and all it was was water. Um, there were a few pieces of wreckage that were floating, and your first thought is, how far into the mud did it go, and what's it going to take to get it out of there? The area around the crash site is awash with aviation fuel and hydraulic fluid. Sweltering in their protective clothing, the local police force are ferried out to search for remains and wreckage in the alligator-infested swamp. Going to the accident site is um, always different, but there's always the similarities. There's the smell of the fuel, if there's been a fire, there's the bad smells in airplane accidents. You get it on your boots, you get it on your clothes, you get it in your hotel room, uh, it, uh, it sticks with you. Um, you, know, you, get, you can get odors your nose gets used to it for a while, but then it's never quite gone. You leave the room, come back in, and, you're, and it smells like an airplane accident. 
Somewhere in these pieces of wreckage lie the vital clues that may help the investigators unlock the mystery of Value Jet Flight 592. Greg Fyth's priority is to find the two so-called black boxes buried somewhere in the swamp. The flight data recorder contains an electronic record of what was happening to the plane, and the cockpit voice recorder tapes the pilots' voices. We used a lot of high-tech equipment, but in the long run, it was found with very low-tech equipment, that is, someone stepping on the boxes. One of the divers walked, and he was, as he was stepping along, he actually kicked something that was fairly solid, he stepped on it, and when he reached down and pulled it up, he found that it was uh, one of the boxes. Flight data recorder. We got the recorder. Well, that's what we've been searching for, huh? That's one, one of them. them. One of them? That's one. The flight data recorder had received some impact flight damage, data. but for the most part, it was in good shape but we don't want the magnetic tape to dry out. So what we do is we pack the flight data recorder in the cooler, submerged, and then make it watertight, and uh, that is now its new home for the four-hour trip to, uh, to Washington that night. In the stifling heat and humidity of the Everglades, the search for more clues goes on. Of the 110 passengers who were on board, only the remains of 65 could be identified. Blackened wreckage and singed dollar bills pointed towards a fire in the aircraft. The cockpit voice recorder confirmed that there had been a fire in the cabin. It was so intense that it melted the floor and seat frames. There were verbal indications from the cockpit that there was fire in the passenger cabin. Greg Feith made an astonishing discovery. 144 oxygen generators were being carried here in the cargo hold of the DC-9 in breach of the regulations about hazardous cargo. They were described as empty but they weren't. When they produce oxygen, they heat up to 500 degrees centigrade. Fyth believes that one generator ignited during takeoff, started a chain reaction with the others, and caused the fire that burnt through the cabin floor. After previous fires, the NTSB has recommended that fire and smoke detectors be fitted in the cargo holds of aircraft. So far, the recommendations have not been acted on. We write these recommendations. We put them forward to not only the FAA, but to the industry. And we get responses back saying that, well, yes, we see this as a problem. However, it's an isolated case. Therefore, the economic impact that it may have does not warrant us taking action right now. We have now lost this aircraft, this value jet airplane with 110 people, presumably due to a fire in a cargo hold that, had it had a detection system uh, or a suppression system, may have given the flight crew some valuable time to get the airplane back to the airport. And while the accident may have occurred, it may not have been as catastrophic as it ended up being. What may have happened in the, in the last minute of flight that we don't have information for is anyone's guess. None of us were there. You can probably picture, if you were in that situation, what might be going on. And as an investigator, it's hard not to do that. What these people were experiencing, what the flight crew was trying to do. You know, each of us has its, our own um, idea of what was probably happening, but it's anyone's guess, and your imagination can run wild with what was happening in that cockpit and in that cabin, given those circumstances. Oh, 
Britain is the birthplace of crash investigation, and it's eight years since the Air Accident Investigation Branch has had to attend a major crash. That was on the 8th of January 1989, when a British Midland Boeing 737 crashed on the verge of the M1 motorway, a hundred yards short of the runway at East Midlands Airport. An engine fire caused the flight crew to shut down one engine, but the passengers watched in amazement as flames continued to pour out of the other. The crew had shut down the wrong engine. The packed aircraft plunged into the bank agonizingly close to safety. 39 people died in the crumpled wreckage. Another eight died later in hospital. Confronted with a scene of absolute disaster, whether it be Lockerbie or Kegworth, the average reaction is, Jesus, where do you start here? Where do you start? Our job in life is to investigate accidents and serious incidents to civilian aircraft, and uh, the object, obviously, is to um, find the causal factors for accidents and to propose recommendations to improve aviation safety, purely recommendations. I mean, this is really our workplace. A major accident scene is where we go to work. It's like a surgeon going to the theater, you know. A disaster over 40 years ago made the British world leaders in crash investigation when they discovered a design flaw in the aircraft that was to be the great hope of British aviation. The Comet, her shapely silver moving into a still July evening in 1949 to take the air for the first time. The de Havilland Comet was the world's first jet passenger aircraft. Revolutionary and all British, it was set to change the face of passenger travel. The maiden flight of this historic aircraft was a typically British, understated affair. Well, it was a fine day, it was July, and uh, I said, right, if it's ready, wheel it out. And um, uh, perfect weather. It was a great moment for all who had planned and sponsored her. There at the controls, John Cunningham. A great moment, but an anxious moment too. Many hundreds of skilled men, the best brains and hands in the business, had put their utmost into her. What snags could possibly develop? And yet, you kept your fingers crossed. Went through the cockpit check and uh, away. And then came Cunningham's terse report from the cockpit. No snag. It flew extremely smoothly and responded to the controls in the best way that the Havilland aircraft usually did. The first flight was for about between 30 and 40 minutes or so, up to a medium height only, and satisfied myself that here was a complete aeroplane. Came back, one fly passed, and those people that were still in the works uh, at the end of the day or uh, were, had remained and I was happy to let them see it in the air, landed, and that was it, as far as I was concerned. But the press were extremely unhappy with the firm because they thought that it was um, deliberately done to avoid them being there. That wasn't so. It was my choice that I was offered the aeroplane. Fine evening. Well, off we go. Six weeks later, at the Fandra air display, the comet made her first public appearance to face the critical eye of the airman's world. It was accepted not only by the public, but by so many of the airlines that came and then wanted to fly in and see what this new aeroplane was. And the problem really was one of, could we build them quickly enough? This was to be a world beater. In one leap, the British could leave behind America's Boeing with their rival 707 still on the drawing board. Orders for Comet flooded in. The chair back cuddles your spine as she surges down the runway. A gentle lift at no great speed, she's soaring towards the upper air. Here was an aeroplane that had plenty of room in it from the pilot's point of view 
a passenger's accommodation that was entirely in keeping with the best passenger airliner comfort and a performance that was double what the best airliner could achieve at that time. Everything for the passengers, even huge picture windows for a spectacular view. And then, disaster. The comet was hit by a series of accidents. Two were blamed on pilots getting used to jet engines. But a third disintegrated in mid-air over Calcutta, killing all on board. Worse was to come, January the 10th, 1954. Comet Yoke Peter disappeared after taking off from Rome bound for London. Wreckage was found floating in the sea off the island of Elba. Six crew and 29 passengers had died. The aviation world held its breath. Would there be a future for jet travel after all? The comet was grounded. With Britain's lead in aviation slipping away, Prime Minister Winston Churchill intervened. He ordered that the mystery of the comet be solved at any price. The investigation team converged on the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. An intense and desperate search began for the comet's fatal flaw. All these early air crash detectives knew was that the aircraft had broken up in mid-air. When we started the investigation, we had a team of four permanent members of the accident section. And it was decided in the very early days that two of us would do the fuselage and two would do the wing. And then over the next period of six months or so, there was a succession of pieces brought back from the salvage team in the Mediterranean. At the beginning of this difficult investigation, there were no clues to explain the cause of the accident. Neither was it known how much of the wreckage would be recovered. When the pieces come in, we have to be able to recognize which part of the main structure that it has come from. And then we start on the process of reconstructing it. And for the comet, we had special frameworks made. And then from that point onwards, we start a sequencing process because we are trying to find the primary failure, the failure which started the whole sequence of breakup of the aircraft in the air. Thousands of pieces of wreckage were brought back, catalogued and then painstakingly reassembled like a huge metal jigsaw, now standard practice in air crash investigation. I think the scale of it was um, something new to us. We hadn't had such large aeroplanes to deal with that had been broken up like this. But you've got to bear in mind that, that uh, while we, this work was going on, we never got a full complement of wreckage. We never got more than about 70% in the end. Then the first clue. The investigators found marks on the outside of the plane made by objects which came from the inside and that this had happened in mid-air. Now, if I were to make an impact mark with this pencil, across here, this paper like that. Now, if I tear that paper, like so, I now have two pieces of wreckage, which when reconstructed, will show that the impact came first. There were marks like this on the fuselage, in particular, a black, thin line towards the tail section. Now, in the very early days, one of the things that we found was that there is a strike running right along there, a black, thin line, which we were able to recover some samples to give to the chemists, and they said it was a rubber compound which was found inside the fuselage furnishings, so that prior to any failure of frame 42, we'd got a hole at the front. The other thing was that in the tail were bits of carpet trapped into the, to the wreckage of the, this tailplane. And there was also an impression of a coin. The carpet and the coin were further proof that something had made the cabin burst open in mid-air, flinging its contents outwards. To find out why, the investigators took a gamble. 
they sent a team of pilots and scientists up to fly a perilous mission in an unpressurized comet laden with instruments. Would the same thing happen again? Anne Burns was one of the scientists involved. Well, there were a lot of safety precautions. We had this parachutes which opened automatically uh, in case one was thrown out of the aircraft unconscious. And when one got down to 13,000 foot, the parachute would open automatically. But this was rather embarrassing, as if you forgot to disarm your parachute. <laughs> It would open inside the fuselage. There'd be a horrible crunching noise at the back. And your parachute would start ballooning out. I don't think people were very frightened or apprehensive. There's always that sort of feeling. It can't happen to me. Of course, one's very occupied with the instrumentation and everything. It was a great privilege to fly. <laughs> take part. The real trouble was that uh, we were flying unpressurized on the high altitude flights and that was very uncomfortable. People got the bends. The air crew and observers spent many tiring hours concentrating on their instruments. No chance of a smoke, but a peppermint helped. Disappointingly, the flight tests came up with no answers. Perhaps they needed to test the comet under pressurized conditions. The investigators came up with an ingenious answer, a way of putting the aircraft through a lifetime of flights within a few weeks in the hope that the fault would reveal itself. A comet was put into a tank. The tank was filled with water, and then more water was pumped under pressure into the cabin of the aircraft. The water pressure inside the cabin could then be raised and lowered to simulate climbing up to 41,000 feet and then descending again without the aircraft ever leaving the ground. Director of the Royal Aircraft Establishment, Sir Arnold Hall. A large tank which was filled with water uh, was built and the fuselage of the aeroplane uh, sat in the water in the tank. The wings came out through sealed sides. Um, the wings had jacks under them, which uh, simulated the force coming on the wing as the aircraft took off, changing du during the flight and coming back on when it landed. Um, and the pressure inside the water in the cabin uh, was uh, oscillated with the change of altitude as the cabin was pumped up to keep the pressurization going as the aircraft got higher. So you could stimulate in a fairly crude way, but nevertheless quite suitable for this sort of test, um, a complete flight. And you could go on doing it quite fast. You didn't have to wait for it while the flights built up. You could uh, keep it going 24 hours a day. At the end of March 1954, the comet took to the skies again. Two weeks later, another one crashed into the sea off Naples, killing all on board. The comet was grounded indefinitely. In that first two and a half weeks, we had got to the stage of simulating about 1,900 separate flights. And uh, I happened to be on my res in, in my bed at night having a rest period when the phone rang and uh, it was my colleague back on the tank there at about two o'clock in the morning. He said, oh, you better come in, we've, we've got a failure. So he said, you what? <laughs> got a failure? Not already, surely. He said, yes, we have. So uh, they sent a car for me then to pick me up, take me into the RAE. And then uh, by that time, they'd got the tank drained down and uh, it was a failure, all right. The fuselage was split more or less from end to end. Initial reaction was well, one of disbelief, and said, "Well, you know, either there's something wrong with the test, or there's, uh, you know, there's, there's something here we don't know about." And of course, it was something we didn't know about. They had come face to face with aviation's newest problem: metal fatigue in pressurized aircraft. The comet's windows weakened the structure. Finding this design flaw made the reputation of Britain's investigators, but doomed the comet. 
It was a disaster, really, um, because the Comet was very much a pioneer aeroplane. It was more highly developed than any other civil aircraft, and the whole hopes of British civil aviation really depended very strongly on how successful the Comets were. Although the Comet was redesigned, the aircraft's reputation never recovered. The real people to benefit from the investigation were the Americans, who learned crucial lessons in designing and building pressurized jets. They have since gone on to dominate the world. But 20 years later, a design flaw in one of their aircraft led to the biggest scandal in aviation history. Menonville Forest, 20 miles north of Paris, March the 3rd, 1974. A Turkish Airlines DC-10 on its way to London ploughed through these trees at 500 miles an hour. All 346 people on board were killed, most of them British. Fifteen entire families were wiped out. These are all new trees here, aren't they? Yes. Michel Vigier was the French investigator in charge, and Tony Cullen, a Royal Air Force pathologist, one of his team. Well, it was the biggest uh, air crash uh, in the world at that moment. Uh, DC-10 completely destroyed. I couldn't believe that a DC-10 could be devastated in such a way. One imagines that an aeroplane will stay more or less an aeroplane shape, but you wouldn't have known it was an aeroplane, really. There were bits of aeroplane and bits of baggage and bits of seats and so on, just hanging from the trees, and it, it looked like a Christmas tree. I don't suppose for one minute that any of them really knew what was happening. More than 20 years later, the forest is still littered with small bits of wreckage. In fact, there's some wreckage over there. Yeah. This was the size of quite a lot of the wreckage at the time. See, we've got some electric cable here. And seat upholstery and all sorts of stuff. Gosh. It's quite eerie, really, isn't it? But they can't clear up everything. Despite the carnage in the forest, it was a discovery nine miles away that was the key to the investigation. In a field, a local farmer found the bodies of six Japanese tourists still strapped in their seats and near them the rear cargo door. A baggage handler at Orly Airport was immediately blamed for not closing the door properly. But this wasn't the first accident to a DC-10 involving the cargo door. Aviation community has got uh, previous uh, alert, so it's easy to uh, deduce that this accident should have not occurred. In 1972, just two years before the Paris disaster, an American Airlines DC-10 suffered a massive cabin depressurization and lost most of its flight controls when the cargo door blew open. The captain that day was Bryce McCormick. Well, I'm very conscious of schedule all the time. We were a little late getting out of Los Angeles. And they were having some trouble with the door closing at that time. And the cargo handler uh, couldn't seem to get the handle down. So he applied his knee to the handle and pushed on it with his knee, and it went closed. But the air vent door to release the pressurization stayed cocked a little bit, which was an indication that it wasn't properly closed, but he didn't realize it. And he thought about it, so he called a mechanic over to take a look at it. And the mechanic thought 707 door, he, that's all he'd been trained on. He hadn't been trained on the cargo door on the DC-10. 
So he thought, well, it'll blow shut from pressurization. The door, this particular um, baggage door that's been the subject of all this, uh, is, is not what we call a plug door. A plug door is one that, uh, of the type that you sit next to in a cabin, where the more the pressure is inside compared to the outside, that door will seal itself more. The baggage door is a different thing. It's essentially hinged so that it'll open on the outside, from the outside, for obvious reasons. It makes it a lot easier to, to open the door and store things and so forth. Well, given that situation, given the pressure inside being higher, it's obvious you have to be very careful to lock that door. But the cargo door on Bryce McCormick's plane wasn't locked. At 10,000 feet, it was ripped open. The dramatic loss of pressure caused the floor at the rear of the aircraft to collapse, which in turn severed most of the flight controls. Only the pilot's extraordinary skills saved the day. My headset flew off. And I was hit in the face with a lot of dirt, dust, and driv uh, rivets. Every airplane comes out of the factory, they just cannot get it absolutely clean, spotless. Give it one depressurization, it'll clean it. Once on the ground, Bryce McCormick saw the extent of the damage and realized how lucky they had been. Now I looked down, I could see that part of the door still hanging on. I realized then it was the door that had caused the problem, but I still couldn't figure out why it took all the controls. After the accident, Chuck Miller urged the Federal Aviation Administration to issue an airworthiness directive requiring DC-10s to be recalled to fix the cargo door. But the FAA is both the regulator and promoter of aviation, and is often accused of being too cozy with the industry it's supposed to control. In a gentleman's agreement with McDonnell Douglas, the FAA changed the proposed recall to a mere recommendation that airlines get their place. Certainly after the Windsor, Ontario incident, we felt that this was perhaps an avoidable accident. And that is very sad, because the whole purpose of accident investigation is to find the cause so that accidents may be avoided. Paris was a landmark accident in the history of aviation. In the sheer number of casualties, the litigation, and the damages. I see people are finding little pieces and putting them on the memorial still. That's a poem in memory of the victims. Um, for eternity, uh, that part of the earth will be a holy part. Makes you realize the magnitude of the disaster when you see all these names. There is only part of the names yes. of the victims. Turkish, yeah. English, Japanese, Japanese French. some French. McDonnell Douglas have never admitted responsibility for anything to do with the cargo door. But their lawyers and insurers eventually agreed to a multi-million dollar settlement on behalf of the victims of the Paris crash. We come with a job to do and we try and be professional about it and not to let our emotions interfere with our job. I find actually this visit more emotional than uh, the first one, which may be surprising, but to me, coming back, as it were, 22 years later is more uh, moving than the, the first visit because we were there to do a job and find out what had happened and we were busy. And uh, this is something I've never done before. This morning, 
at 0830 hours UTC at Cranfield here, there was an accident involving a Piper Asta aircraft. Eddie Trimble is a senior accident investigator with the British Air Accident Investigation Branch. Every summer, he helps to run a course for would-be accident investigators. We'll show you where it is. The Aztec is roughly in this position here, and it's gone into the, the southern edge of the woods. Most countries now have their own crash detectives, and many of them are trained here at Cranfield. All right, gentlemen, another five minutes, and then we'll leave Team One on site, okay? Basically, it's to teach them the general approach to acts investigation, and uh, it's really the same procedure you use here as you will use in a, in a major accident. All you've got on a bigger aircraft is more complexity in the systems. They've been um, listening to lectures for four weeks on all aspects of air accident investigation. They've had a lot of uh, presentations from our guys on real accidents, mostly major accidents, civil and military accidents. And this is really the first chance they've had to put that together and to actually go hands-on and uh, employ the techniques that they've been taught, you know. Investigators are looking for the cause of accidents and how to survive them. We're the best world in the world. As long as people design, build and fly aircraft, there are going to be accidents by the sheer nature of, of the business. Uh, hopefully the rate will, will reduce over the years. Um, but that being so, and particularly in view of the fact that aircraft are being designed to carry more and more passengers, it makes good sense to try and draw the survivability lessons from accidents. Now people will say to you, yes, but we design aircraft to fly, not to crash. Fair enough. I dare say the car manufacturers will respond that they design cars to be driven, not to crash. But they know they're going to crash and they take sensible precautions based on modern technology. And it doesn't seem to stop cars selling. In fact, there is an argument that uh, safety sells cars. We have the technology to do it. There's no question of it. The only question is, are we going to do it before we have a thousand-seater aircraft? In 1985, there was a tragic accident at Manchester Airport that is still etched on the memory of Eddie Trimble. It proved to be a landmark for the British investigators as it demonstrated how poorly modern aircraft are designed for survival. The Boeing 737 never left the ground and yet 55 people died. Just seconds before takeoff, a piece of the left-hand engine suddenly flew out and pierced a panel in the underside of the wing. Fuel poured out and burst into flames, engulfing the rear of the aircraft. Within seconds, the cabin filled with smoke and the windows began to melt. The crew, who were unable to see, thought a tire had burst. They were unaware of the pandemonium breaking out behind them as people climbed over the seats and each other to try to get out. Passengers got jammed in the narrow aisle between the bulkheads, many of them overcome by fumes. There was a, a Mr. Metcalf sat in seat 8. I think it was, and uh, he uh, collapsed in the area, passed out as far as he's concerned. He came to, and his description of the effects was quite striking. He described his mouth and nostrils and ears as clogged with carbonaceous debris uh, with the consistency of oxo cubes. As the fire took hold of the interior, plastic cabin fittings and foam upholstery in the seats produced more heat and poisonous fumes. The scramble intensified. Now there was two young girls, roughly 18 to 20, sat in seats uh, E and F at row 10, which is overwing row. And uh, they were coming under a lot of pressure from other passengers to open the overwing exit. Now obviously, uh, passengers don't have any practice in operating such exits. And she looked at the emergency hatch and she pulled on the armrest which in that position is actually affixed to the, to the hatch, um, thinking that, that would unhitch the hatch. Her friend who was sat in seat 10E uh, looked up and saw the emergency pool placard at the top of the door 
and she stood up, reached and pulled the, the handle. The door, which weighed 48 pounds, then pivoted about its lower edge inboards and fell across the first girl in the seat, effectively trapping in her seat. Uh, a passenger sat immediately behind them, I think his name was a Mr. Coxon, grabbed the hatch and manhandled it over and put it on uh, seat 11D. And uh, then people began to go out of the overwing. The Manchester accident has left a lasting impression on Eddie Trimble and it introduced him to the parents of Sarah Beckett, one of those who died. Not prepared to be fobbed off, the Beckett's have become articulate and passionate campaigners for improved cabin safety. It hadn't crashed. It was just a craft that hadn't taken off. You know, as, as you said, the fire service is in attendance within two minutes. It had half the exits open. Why did 55 die? You know, it's, and I think it's, it's, it's those sort of questions that push us. We needed to know the answers. The AIB themselves had said this should have been a survivable accident. Um, so what was it in the cabin environment that prevented 55 people from getting out of that plane alive? Most of the victims at Manchester died from inhaling poisonous fumes, raising the case for the British regulator, the Civil Aviation Authority, to provide passengers with smoke hoods. The CAA refused. Although they ordered the introduction of fire blocking material in aircraft seats and floor lighting in the cabin. We recommended that the CAA urgently formulate a requirement uh, for the provision of uh, smoke hood protection to passengers to uh, cater for those kind of instances. Whilst the investigation being going on and whilst comments were being made, we got total faith that the thing was being resolved. When the statement was made in December 88 by the, AI, by the CAA that they weren't going to pursue smoke hoods, we suddenly thought, hang on a minute, there was a, there was a total uh, knot formed in the stomach to say we've been conned. There was other recommendations on, as I've uh, discussed, the question of the forward bulkhead, the question of the overwing. Uh, in fact, I think um, it was recommended in the Manchester report that um, the row 10, the row of seats, should be taken out. And uh, obviously something less than that was uh, eventually uh, uh, decided upon by the regulatory side. Survivors complained that passengers were prevented from escaping because the access to the doors was too narrow. In any building, fire regulations stipulate that it has to be 30 inches. An ordinary door is two feet, six inches wide. That's been researched out of sight. Why is it necessary for the aviation industry to think that it's anything different? It's arguably more dangerous. So it is not exactly the um, scientific breakthrough of the century to have a, a door increase from 20 inches to 30 inches and to see that implemented and for it to be safer to fly. I think when you read through passenger testimony and when you meet those survivors and uh, when you look at the photographs taken by the fire crew of the scene in that cabin, then you, you do become fairly motivated to try and do something about it. That essentially is our job. It's been a challenge that, uh, you know, has had the best motivation in the world. You can't have a better motivation than losing a daughter. All we can do is to try and bring it to the public attention, just to remind them of their responsibilities. And their responsibilities are to us as the flying passenger, not just to the commercial interests of airlines and airline operators. Air crash detectives learn from accidents. They want to prevent them from ever happening again. But, the but their work is in vain if their recommendations are not heeded. Unless the lessons are learnt and implemented in this business, we're not making as good progress as we can. And uh, frankly, uh, a lot of investigators may as well go and lie on a beach as do accident investigation as long as, long as that pertains. The deadly effects of faulty maintenance is the subject for next week's programme. That's at the same time of nine o'clock here on four. Also, black...
stepping on the boxes. One of the divers walked, and he was, as he was stepping along, he actually kicked something that was fairly solid, he stepped on it, and when he reached down and pulled it up, he found that it was uh, one of the boxes. Flight data recorder. Got the recorder. Well, that's what we've been searching for, huh? That's one, one of them. them. One of them? That's one. The flight data recorder had received some impact damage, but for the most part, it was in good shape. But we don't want the magnetic tape to dry out. So what we do is we pack the flight data recorder in the cooler, submerged, and then make it watertight, and uh, that is now its new home for the four-hour trip to, uh, to Washington that night. In the stifling heat and humidity of the Everglades, the search for more clues goes on. Of the 110 passengers who were on board, only the remains of 65 could be identified. Blackened wreckage and singed dollar bills pointed towards a fire in the aircraft. The cockpit voice recorder confirmed that there had been a fire in the cabin. It was so intense that it melted the floor and seat frames. There were verbal indications from the cockpit that there was fire in the passenger cabin. Greg Fyth made an astonishing discovery. 144 oxygen generators were being carried here in the cargo hold of the DC-9 in breach of the regulations about hazardous cargo. They were described as empty, but they weren't. When they produce oxygen, they heat up to 500 degrees centigrade. Fyth believes that one generator ignited during takeoff, started a chain reaction with the others, and caused the fire that burnt through the cabin floor. After previous fires, the NTSB has recommended that fire and smoke detectors be fitted in the cargo holds of aircraft. So far, the recommendations have not been acted on. We write these recommendations. We put them forward to not only the FAA, but to the industry. And we get responses back saying that, well, yes, we see this as a problem. However, it's an isolated case. Therefore, the economic impact that it may have does not warrant us taking action right now. We have now lost this aircraft, this value jet airplane with 110 people, presumably due to a fire in a cargo hold that had it had a detection system uh, or a suppression system may have given the flight crew some valuable time to get the airplane back to the airport. And while the accident may have occurred, it may not have been as catastrophic as it ended up being. What may have happened in the, in the last minute of flight that we don't have information for is anyone's guess. None of us were there. You can probably picture, if you were in that situation, what might be going on. And as an investigator, it's hard not to do that. What these people were experiencing, what the flight crew was trying to do. You know, each of us has his, our own um, idea of what was probably happening, but it's anyone's guess, and your imagination can run wild with what was happening in that cockpit and in that cabin, given those circumstances. Britain is the birthplace of crash investigation, and it's eight years since the Air Accident Investigation Branch has had to attend a major crash. That was on the 8th of January 1989, when a British Midland Boeing 737 crashed on the verge of the M1 motorway, a hundred yards short of the runway at East Midlands Airport. An engine fire caused the flight crew to shut down one engine, but the passengers watched in amazement as flames continued to pour out of the other. The crew had shut down the wrong engine. The packed aircraft plunged into the bank, agonizingly close to safety. 
39 people died in the crumpled wreckage. Another eight died later in hospital. Confronted with a scene of absolute disaster, whether it be Lockerbie or Kegworth, the average reaction is, Jesus, where do you start here? Where do you start? Our job in life is to investigate accidents and serious incidents to civilian aircraft, and uh, the object, obviously, is to um, find the causal factors for accidents and to propose recommendations to improve aviation safety, purely recommendations. I mean, this is really our workplace. A major accident scene is where we go to work. It's like a surgeon going to the theater, you know. A disaster over 40 years ago made the British world leaders in crash investigation when they discovered a design flaw in the aircraft that was to be the great hope of British aviation. The Comet, her shapely silver moving into a still July evening in 1949 to take the air for the first time. The de Havilland Comet was the world's first jet passenger aircraft. Revolutionary and all British, it was set to change the face of passenger travel. The maiden flight of this historic aircraft was a typically British, understated affair. Well, it was a fine day, it was July, and uh, I said, right, if it's ready, wheel it out. And um, uh, perfect weather. It was a great moment for all who had planned and sponsored her. There at the controls, John Cunning. A great moment, but an anxious moment too. Many hundreds of skilled men, the best brains and hands in the business, had put their utmost into her. What snags could possibly develop? And yet, you kept your fingers crossed. Went through the cockpit check and uh, away. And then came Cunningham's terse report from the cockpit. No snag. It flew extremely smoothly and responded to the controls in the best way that the Havilland aircraft usually did. The first flight was for about between 30 and 40 minutes or so, up to a medium height only, and satisfied myself that here was a complete aeroplane. Came back, one fly passed, and those people that were still in the works uh, at the end of the day or had, well, had remained and I was happy to let them see it in the air, landed, and that was it, as far as I was concerned. But the press were extremely unhappy with the firm because they thought that it was um, deliberately done to avoid them being there. That wasn't so. It was my choice that I was offered the aeroplane. Fine evening. Well, off we go. Six weeks later, at the Farnborough air display, the Comet made her first public appearance to face the critical eye of the airman's world. It was accepted not only by the public, but, of course, but by so many of the airlines that came and then wanted to fly in and see what this new aeroplane was. And the problem really was one of, could we build them quickly enough? This was to be a world beater. In one leap, the British could leave behind America's Boeing with their rival 707 still on the drawing board. Orders for Comet flooded in. The chair back cuddles your spine as she surges down the runway. A gentle lift at no great speed, she's soaring towards the upper air. Here was an aeroplane that had plenty of room in it from the pilot's point of view. A passenger's accommodation that was entirely in keeping with the best passenger airliner comfort and a performance that was double what the best airliner could achieve at that time. Everything for the passengers, even huge picture windows for a spectacular view. And then, disaster. The comet was hit by a series of accidents. Two were blamed on pilots getting used to jet engines. But a third disintegrated in mid-air over Calcutta, Q-1. 
killing all on board. Worse was to come, January the 10th, 1954. Comet Yoke Peter disappeared after taking off from Rome bound for London. Wreckage was found floating in the sea off the island of Elba. Six crew and 29 passengers had died. The aviation world held its breath. Would there be a future for jet travel after all? The comet was grounded. With Britain's lead in aviation slipping away, Prime Minister Winston Churchill intervened. He ordered that the mystery of the comet be solved at any price. The investigation team converged on the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. An intense and desperate search began for the comet's fatal flaw. All these early air crash detectives knew was that the aircraft had broken up in mid-air. When we started the investigation, we had a team of four permanent members of the accident section. And it was decided in the very early days that two of us would do the fuselage and two would do the wing. And then over the next period of six months or so, there was a succession of pieces brought back from the salvage team in the Mediterranean. At the beginning of this difficult investigation, there were no clues to explain the cause of the accident. Neither was it known how much of the wreckage would be recovered. When the pieces come in, we have to be able to recognize which part of the main structure that it has come from. And then we start on the process of reconstructing it. And for the comet, we had special frameworks made. And then from that point onwards, we start a sequencing process because we are trying to find the primary failure, the failure which started the whole sequence of breakup of the aircraft in the air. Thousands of pieces of wreckage were brought back, catalogued and then painstakingly reassembled like a huge metal jigsaw, now standard practice in air crash investigation. I think the scale of it was um, something new to us. We hadn't had such large aeroplanes to deal with that had been broken up like this. But you've got to bear in mind that, that uh, while this work was going on, we never got a full complement of wreckage. We never got more than about 70% in the end. Then the first clue. The investigators found marks on the outside of the plane made by objects which came from the inside and that this had happened in mid-air. Now, if I were to make an impact mark with this pencil across here, this paper like that, now, if I tear that paper, like so, I now have two pieces of wreckage, which when reconstructed, will show that the impact came first. There were marks like this on the fuselage, in particular a black, thin line towards the tail section. Now, in the very early days, one of the things that we found was that there is a strike running right along there, a black, thin line, which we were able to recover some samples to give to the chemists, and they said it was a rubber compound which was found inside the fuselage furnishings, so that prior to any failure of frame 42, we'd got a hole at the front. The other thing was that in the tail were bits of carpet, trapped into the, to the wreckage of the, this tailplane. And there was also an impression of a coin. The carpet and the coin were further proof that something had made the cabin burst open in mid-air, flinging its contents outwards. To find out why, the investigators took a gamble. They sent a team of pilots and scientists up to fly a perilous mission in an unpressurized comet laden with instruments. Would the same thing happen again? Anne Burns was one of the scientists involved. Well, there were a lot of safety precautions. We had this parachutes which opened automatically in case one was thrown out of the aircraft unconscious. And when one got down to 13,000 foot, the parachute.